Hello, everyone, and welcome to this expert audio interview. Today, we're joined by a longtime private equity professional who's worked in both real estate and general industry private equity. Thanks so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. So what type of private equity, and I know the, it was a brief introduction there, but pre, what type of private equity strategies have you worked with or helped to carry out? So I've actually been fortunate and have worked across the most of the different types of private equity strategies. So that includes, um, as you mentioned, uh, real estate investing. It also includes um, general industry. So after spending time in real estate, I was able to move into investing in other industries such as uh, pharmaceuticals, um, IT, and services businesses. And inside of that practice, I was involved in both growth capital and uh, buyout and control type investments. So these included uh, take private, delisting of listed companies, and then repositioning them for uh, future listing. It included buyouts of private companies, and as I had mentioned also, um, quite a bit of growth capital investments in rapidly growing businesses. Mm Mm-hmm. What differentiates a successful and unsuccessful private equity firm? Well, in terms of success, and that is, it's I would say, the ability to generate um, great returns for investors, mm-hmm. I think it involves, uh, number one, um, being able to have industry expertise um, so that you're able to add value to the portfolio companies. And in many cases... It's having operational expertise. Now, these days, one sees a lot of uh, private equity firms really emphasizing their value-added capability, and different firms take different approaches to this. Some of them will build in-house uh, portfolio management teams, such as KKR, with their development of uh, Capstone. It's essentially a captive in-house consulting team, which works with the portfolio companies. In other cases, you'll see firms like TPG bring in-house a number of ex-CEO, ex-C-level, um, you know, very sort of um, very successful C-level uh, rock stars in the industries, and then have them in-house consulting to the portfolio teams and uh, to the portfolio companies. So ultimately, it seems that one of the greatest factors of success for a private equity firm is its ability to add value to the underlying portfolio companies. Additionally, it's the ability, number two would be the ability to generate proprietary deals. Uh, I think that's getting harder and harder because there's so many different firms out there and you know, a lot of the investment banks have you know, fairly well-built out teams which are serving um, the private equity funds. So a lot of the deals are getting... Uh, shopped around very widely. A lot of uh, different firms are out there scouring the market. But, you know, know, the ability to generate proprietary deals that other people are not looking at, of course, is another great factor for success. Mm -hmm. And then uh, three, it's, um, you know, know, another factor of success for any private equity firm is its ability um, to, uh, to raise capital. So, you know, you have quite a number of uh, firms out there that are now struggling with capital raising. So this is another aspect. Um, You want to be able to to keep good relationships with your LPs and keep an open and transparent dialogue with them. Part of that's a capital raising aspect. Part of that's an investor relations aspect. Um, For the most part, I think um, LPs are actually willing to have to work with you know a very consistent slightly lower returning fund provided that this fund is able to um, be consistent be transparent and um, keep the dialogue strong uh, fourth aspect is probably um, the ability of a firm to have a unique differentiation and uh, a definitive strategy and to not drift from that strategy so strategic drift is something that concerns a lot of investors these days as well. Mm-hmm. What are some characteristics that you feel are required or maybe just helpful for a private equity professional? So a professional in private equity uh, ideally would have 
um, some of the things that we just uh, spoke to. Mm -hmm. um, it would have the ability to generate proprietary deals. You know, that comes from having a great industry network, uh, possibly within a, you know, a very specific industry um, where you can know all, know a lot of the major players and be able to find deals ahead of other people. Uh, two, it's having great competence within a specific industry so that you're able to add definitive value to the companies, but also so that you know what are the great investments so that when the right company comes across the desk that you know that it's the right company. Uh, you know, it's also um, private equity being sort of... Um, all-encompassing and multidisciplinary, I think it takes many different types of skills. So you have to have financial analysis uh, capability. You have to have fantastic um, modeling skills. You have to have great relationship building and negotiating skills so that you're able to negotiate a good deal with the portfolio company and also so that you can still maintain a good relationship with them after the negotiation is complete. Um, you also from... Um, the, and then probably would also come back to um, uh, legal and structuring. So that's another important aspect. So being able to set the contracts, term sheets, uh, and send protections correctly to be able to do uh, the proper due diligence on a company from a legal standpoint, also from an industry and market standpoint, is also very important. Mm -hmm. And then the fundraising skill set, as mentioned before, so the ability to build strong relationships with limited partners, to be able to persuade them that what you're doing is unique and valuable, and to be able to um, consistently come back to market and find a ready appetite. I think if one looks at both venture capital and private equity and which firms have been consistently the strongest performers, it's the ones that um, have established themselves as being the best firm for the entrepreneurs to work with in, in the case of growth capital. Uh, in the case of, you know, buyouts, it's the, it's the firms that are the best to sell your fund to, your firm to, because they're going to shepherd it and take good care of it. Mm -hmm. What do you do to stay up to date? Do you do a lot of reading or education? So what's a way to keep you uh, a very valuable uh, professional in PE? That's a tougher question. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a tougher question uh, because, uh, of course, you know, doing reading is incredibly important. Um, going to conferences and you know, learning seminars is something that I, I do a fair amount of as well. But I don't think that that really grows the skill set very much. I think, you know, it's it's useful to go to financial modeling courses and it's useful to hear speakers talk about private equity but that's very that, that's that's sort of you know on the 80 20 that's definitely not what's getting you the greatest value mm -hmm. i think the greatest value in order to keep current in the industry is to be out there doing deals and that's that's a you know private equity is sort of an environment where the information the materials, uh, you know, what's going on is typically not shared, not disclosed. The only thing you, you learn about is when, long after the fact, so-and-so large firm will be covered in the press as having made an acquisition or made an investment or so-and-so is, is exiting their previous deal. Well, by the time you hear that, it's already too late to be involved. It's already too late for that to be very meaningful. You still have to do that reading, but really there's no substitute for actually being in the field and doing deals. Mm -hmm. And you know, beyond that, I think finding a good mentor or a series of mentors or even peers at one same, at one same level um, can be very helpful because that enables you to learn from other people in the industry. And if you're fortunate enough to find some good mentors, that can really open up the whole world. But you certainly can't learn this trade in a book. Uh, it is much more of an apprenticeship model, and that means that there's uh, quite a bit of variance. You know, I think you know, in, in some cases now, some you know, as some of the firms have gotten larger, there is a more established process for learning. But out there in the PE world, there's just so much variance between firms that actually getting a consistent learning process is very difficult. 
but the people that I've seen succeed best are the ones that have been able to find uh, a seasoned professional that can take them under their wing and show them the ropes, take a real interest in their personal development, and similarly are loyal to that mentor. Uh, I, I know um, one of my friends has actually followed his, uh, his mentor to three firms now, and I think mm-hmm. that his career has grown exponentially because he's shown that loyalty and that consistent performance and because uh, he's been fortunate enough to find a mentor that's that's taken him under his wing. So even when their one of their previous funds um, ended up shutting down and my friend had options to go to other uh, funds, um, but without his mentor, he actually deferred and sat on the sidelines for over a year waiting for the next opportunity where he could follow his mentor to the next to the next fund and I think he's benefited from that so if mm-hmm. you can find a good mentor then that can be a great catalyst for growth but of course one can't really necessarily go out there and look for a mentor you can only network and hope you find somebody who takes a personal interest mm-hmm. what types of valuation models or formulas do you use for your process of valuation which types of models do we use for valuation? So, you know, typically, um, you know, we're, it's an LBO model. If we're doing an LBO, it's, uh, you know, it, it's uh, or a growth capital model for you know, growth capital investments. Um, there's nothing sort of um, proprietary about that. I think a lot of these are sort of, um, you know, out there and well understood. I think what's key is to try to, in every case, do a lot of due diligence on the company so that your inputs are correct and to try to build the model to the extent that you can from scratch so they can really take the time to understand the business. And I think, you know, putting in some good scenario planning is also very important. Mm -hmm. What are a few examples, and this can be, you know, very generic or anonymous if you'd like, or case studies of private equity strategies that you've helped carry out? I'm sorry, can you please repeat the question? So, for example, what was a typical process you went through to come up with a strategy to identify acquisition targets, you know, eventually uh, execute them or exit companies? So what's, what's an example of a case study that you've done in the past? Okay. Um... So I'll expand. I'll, I'll answer and expand. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the firm that I was with, uh, that, that I, the firm that I've uh, worked with um, longest, um, typically does not use brokers. So we do a lot of our own uh, deal sourcing. Uh, in this particular case, we did. We had identified an industry that we wanted to be investors in. This is, uh, you know, far earlier. You know, quite a number of years ago. So we were actually very keen on uh, clean tech and uh, solar in particular. But this is, you know, much earlier. Now that's not uh, an attractive industry anymore. Um, but you know, a number of years ago, we identified that this was a sector that we wanted to be in, and started building our own network by going to uh, industry conferences around clean tech. And we had identified um, one company um, which was very compelling and uh, we built the relationship um, with the uh, entrepreneur and came to really through conversations to understand what his struggles were. And there was a lot of issues. It was a very rapidly growing business, uh, had the ambition to list within the near future during the time when there was this huge rush to list companies uh, in clean tech. And so... You know, there's a lot of um, hands-on work that needed to happen. So um, we we're fortunate enough to be able to you know, understand the problems and be able to sit down with the entrepreneur and come up with a strategy for um, working on some of these issues to help uh, grow the business, to help recruit you know, you know, a person for you know, a number of different uh, slots. Um, 
that that uh, clearly needed to be filled. And uh, then we actually went into the company once the investment was concluded. One, so then we negotiated the investment, put in um, terms where we could you know share in uh, the upside together, um, where the entrepreneur clearly could make the lion's share of the money, but that we could also benefit. And then we actually sent in a number of uh, people on the staff, including myself, to spend time at the company and help work out um, some of these issues. And then we essentially became like uh, hired guns, so to speak, um, as members of the team. So we were there uh, on site continuously, uh, actually relocated to the town of uh, where this company was based, and uh, you know spent quite a number of months helping to make strategic hires, build out the team, uh, travel, uh, actually initially before uh, other offices were opened um, you know we were flying around and uh, actually getting sales contracts and negotiating on behalf of the company as company staff as company uh, representatives um, and and helping them to grow sales and then you know when that became far too burdensome, we were able to identify people to head up the different regions and then conducted interviews and, you know, essentially hired, or rather made the recommendation to the board to hire, but, you know, essentially hired um, the regional uh, sales heads and, uh, you know, worked with the investment bank uh, to get the company ready for listing, um, you know, and that could be as hands-on as actually coming up with the marketing material, you know, corralling internal data um, to be able to uh, to get um, all the due diligence process uh, for the IPO to happen. And, um, you know, then uh, just to um, – and then, you know, once the IPO – and then just prior to IPO, we actually brought in uh, a couple of strategic value-added investors um, that were able to – uh, again, help with uh, business development issues, and then uh, post IPO um, to uh, provide continuous um, investor relations coaching to um, to the the C levels as they were um, you know, managing the process and the story of having a, a public company. And then uh, a number of uh, years later, we exited. You know, it's a you know great project. And there was also, a, because there was these earlier strategic investors that had been brought in, who remained, because, they, again, they were strategic investors, um, I believe that the lasting impact on the company um, was maintained. Mm-hmm. Maybe backing up a little bit, how did you get your start in PE? What, what was your career path? My career path was, uh, I'd say, the standard path, you know, a certain amount of time in investment banking um, in order to learn the financial modeling, to learn how to do diligence companies, to learn how to communicate with, uh, with uh, various uh, management uh, teams, and then subsequently uh, joined a small firm, which ended up growing quite nicely. So sort of standard path banking to PE. Mm-hmm. So that's a fairly typical route that people go? Absolutely. Okay. I think, you know, you see now more and more, um, you call them venture partners or operating partners, but that's at a very senior level. So still be of my pay, above and beyond my uh, pay grade at present. But mm-hmm. a number of people are now getting... Um, hired in from industry as greater industry expertise and as um, and as industry network and as um, value adding becomes ever more important Mm -hmm. why do private equity firms look to exit a company you know why why don't you guys retain that investment if it's if it's a good investment Right. So private equity companies, by definition, have to exit. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we raise funds from uh, third parties. You know, that's your endowments, foundations, pension funds, insurance companies, and fund of funds. The fund typically has a limited life of, oh, I don't know, seven years uh, or some derivative of that. Some are five years in faster growing markets, etc. So we're forced to exit. We have to exit. We have to give 
you know, XYZ endowment back their money. So that's why we exit. Um, but, you know, your question belies um, an interesting sort of a uh, thought, which is, does private equity with the forced exit make sense? Or are there cases where one ought to just raise um, a more evergreen structure? And there are a few of those out there. Um, so you have, for instance, American Capital, which is a listed vehicle. Uh, it went public as a, a BDC, Business Development uh, Corporation. And they have an evergreen pool of money. They still apply private equity principles, but once they make an acquisition, they can just continue to hold it. Um, you have um, companies like uh, Berkshire Hathaway. You know, to a great extent, I would actually say that uh, some of what Warren Buffett does is private equity-like, and he's not forced to sell. He will hold Geico forever, I'm sure. So this is um, one of the advantages that some of these listed uh, vehicles can have. And you have also in Europe uh, CCAVs and some additional listed vehicles. Um, but as we've seen in 2008, 2009, that actually having a listed vehicle for private equity can be a double-edged sword. Um, one of the advantages of private equity is that it shouldn't be subject to public market fluctuations and the given day-to-day -day impressions of investors. And so, you know, there's a real question on whether or not a listed vehicle makes sense for private equity. But, you know, this is more of a sort of philosophical, theoretical question. Um, you know, if one's just drilling right down to the basic of your question of why do we exit, it's because we have to. Mm. That's just part of being a PE fund? It's just part of being a, a PE fund as opposed to a holding company, a business development uh, corporation, or an in-house um, captive uh, venture or investment arm. Mm -hmm. What do you think, in your experience, has been a, a very costly mistake and maybe one that you've learned from or one that you've seen others do uh, in, a, in private equity? What's, what's a mistake that you see as being one that should be avoided? <laughs> are you asking a mistake that I've made in my career that I wish I hadn't, or are you asking about a mistake um, that I've seen private equity funds do that are best to be avoided. Yeah, maybe more on the company side. So, okay. you know, uh, not doing due diligence or, uh, you know, I'm sure there's other things as well that aren't as basic. But I think being um, rushed to make an investment um, without having ample opportunity to do due diligence can be, is, is basically a recipe for disaster. Mm. Uh, um, I think over-reliance on legal protections can be a big mistake. So if you're counting on the contractual clauses to protect you, you know, in the event of uh, a company doing poorly, um, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, bankruptcy still happens. Um, Write-downs still happen. Uh, and one really has to consider counterparty risk. Uh, I think you really want to get to know the entrepreneur, to know who you're dealing with. Um, and to really understand the underlying business so that you're investing in something that has um, the right sort of uh, components to it and the right sort of worth. Um, I'd say that, you know, overpaying for a business is, of course, always a huge problem, but one doesn't know you're overpaying generally on, until later. So mm -hmm. those are probably the three things that I would point to. Okay. And maybe just to close here, unless you had something else you wanted to talk about, what would be your number one tip for someone looking to enter the PE field or, you know, to become a more valuable employee? What would be your number one tip? I think it's very challenging. I think particularly now private equity remains very hot and a lot of people are trying to get in and those who are in are not necessarily looking to leave. I would say it takes time and patience building up uh, a network because typically PE firms are not hiring through a formal process. Mm. Um, and trying to bring specific 
uh, proprietary knowledge and expertise to the table. So if you know something about a given industry, say, I don't know, pharmaceutical and medical device, um, heavy industrial, um, fast-moving consumer goods, if you're able to sort of carve out a role as an expert in something, you know, then you have a real advantage. Uh, for myself, I had expertise early in real estate, and so that's something that initially helped me, although I've subsequently moved away from that. Um, if you are from a consulting background and you have and you're able to prove an ability to add value to portfolio companies, um, I think that's often very much appreciated. Um, you need to really differentiate yourself, and I think that that's a challenge in a crowded space. But that's what you need to do. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, additionally, um, you need to be able to build that network to be able to let that differentiation fall upon the right ears at the right time. And I think that that's very tricky. And it's particularly tricky as a lot of the firms are, are shrinking, as the senior people are choosing not to retire. Uh, it becomes very difficult. Mm hmm. Was there anything we we didn't cover that you'd like to touch on? Um, I mean, I I think you know, it's a fantastic industry, and I think that mm-hmm. if you if you're talking to candidates who are looking to get in, I think that it is a great place to be. Um, I think one needs to you know explore the field widely and try to find opportunities across the field widely, and not just talk, not just speak to a small number of participants, but speak to a wider number of participants. I think one needs to really cultivate a network. I think that's something to really emphasize. And I think one also needs to come up with a plan B, because you can't guarantee getting into the industry, and you don't want to sit on the sidelines forever. Um, I think that you know, being able to differentiate is important. And I think, you know, if I'm to put a, a, a plug, you know, generally to the public overall, is I think PE is one of the most misunderstood fields out there. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, with the, the recent election, everyone's talking about Mitt Romney and Bain Capital, and, you know, there's it's sort of, you know, a quasi-vilified field, and I think that that's completely untrue. I think it's, in fact, 180 degrees from the truth. I think private equity, when executed properly, creates jobs, spearheads innovation, and pushes our economy forward. And I mean, I, I'm very proud of uh, of what I do. And in the case, you know, that I provided earlier about a clean tech company, you know, we helped bring some very meaningful products to the market, which, you know, help prevent um, the production of energy through polluting means. You know, we were producing energy through uh, renewable sources. And I'm very proud of that. And, you know, when you see a business go from, you know, a handful of people to several hundred or several thousand, you can really feel that you've had a positive impact on society. And so there's that aspect, which I'd like to touch to, touch upon. I'm not saying this happens every time. I'm not saying there aren't cases where people have, you know, taken private equity and, you know, companies have, uh, you know, you know, good companies have been gutted. But I think that in, in you know the case of distressed investing, I've seen companies which were going to go into bankruptcy end up being salvaged and were able to maintain you know quite a number of employees, maybe not as much as they did when they was at its peak, but you know quite a number. And uh, you know I think in a, you know in a great sense, you know I think doing private equity is for me at least a mission. It's a mission to be able to provide capital for companies that are growing. It's an opportunity to um, work with companies. Um, that are that are creating good products that benefit society overall, be it you know mm. healthcare, clean tech, or just even just you know your basic needs as a consumer. And uh, and and I very much feel that it's a privilege to work in the industry. And so you know this is sort of one of those things which if I had a soapbox, I mean I wish I could speak to you know the the noise that was happening around the election and say mm-hmm. you know this is definitely the opposite of what's what private equity is supposed to do. Mm. Yeah, there was, you know, a lot of confusion around what happened, especially with I think the stigma that investments have now. <laughs> I think that that's that's unfortunate because I think whereas many countries around the world have taken private equity and supported it and said this is something that we encourage and as a a government we need 
and as a country we need and I, I give examples like Korea Israel you know uh, Singapore, et cetera. There have been a lot of places around the world that have really embraced private equity as a force for making a positive impact. I think in the United States, um, you know, maybe because it started off in the U.S. as uh, leveraged buyouts or maybe because of a variety of different factors, it tends to have been really vilified, and I think that that's unfortunate because it's definitely mm-hmm. not happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. I know it's early for you, but I appreciate you taking part of your morning. It's a pleasure. Thank you, and be well. Thank you, you too.